Hey, indie filmmakers, I'm Nick Bodmer. Hi, I'm Griffin Hammond, and on this week's episode, we've each been traveling with a bunch of camera gear, so let's talk about what camera bags we use. Plus, your questions about filming a dance class, capturing clear audio, and how to script a documentary film. Hey, Nick. Hey, Griffin. How are you? I'm good. Where are you right now? Where am I? I am in beautiful Chicago, Illinois. Well, really, okay. the, the suburbs of. Sitting in the backyard at my parents' house, because I am on vacation. When do you finally go home? Tonight. Tonight. Oh, cool. So this is the last day of vacation for me. So I don't know if you agree with this, but when I was setting up my podcast setup today, I was feeling like it always feels like more work for me when I'm at home. Like, I there's more pressure to get it right. When I'm on the road, I feel like, hey, there's like a background. <laughs> I don't know. Was it difficult for you? Well, it was a little difficult just because I was having some technical problems. But uh, I think my shot probably looks better than it normally does because I'm sitting outside on a patio. And I got a beautiful yes. overcast sky uh, and, uh, and a little bit of depth of field. So I think it'll be nice. Yeah, so the light on you is probably great because it's overcast. You probably, though, have a blown-out sky. Sky looks a little blown out from what yeah. I can see, yeah. But uh, but that's cool. Yeah, What's absolutely. your? How are you recording? Like, what, what gear do you have on the road with you to record this? Well, I packed probably a little too much gear for a week-and-a-half vacation, but... Uh... <laughs> <laughs> in fact, I'll share you a picture I have of uh, of all the gear I packed. Um, <laughs> but uh, just for this, so I've got my G85. So actually, this is the first episode I'm recording with the G85 and the oh, cool. 12, 12 to 35 lens. So I got that going. Then I have a Rode VideoMic Pro that I'm actually running into a Tascam DR08 little pocket audio recorder. And so hopefully that sounds okay. Uh, I was having a little trouble getting... Uh, decent sounding audio out of it. When I was monitoring with headphones, it was all distorted. But I, I did a test and I imported it into my Mac real quick and it sounded good, if a little low. So you're probably going to have to boost me into a little noise reduction would be my guess. But I'm uh, looking at the picture you sent me of, of your setup now and I was wondering how you were going to mount the microphone not on the camera because obviously you want to get it as close as possible. It's right here. I didn't realize you had a table there to set it on. Yeah, so I'm sitting at a, at a patio table, and I've pulled uh, up a chair that does not go with the table, so it's a little lower, which I think helps because it gets the camera kind of just above eye level. And then I've got the mic propped up on a battery charger. Uh, oh, yeah, I saw that. So you're not using the battery charger? You're just <laughs> well, it is using charging, it. Well, it is charging my phone at the same time. But okay. <laughs> it's perfect. It's perfect. Why not, right? And then I've got my iPad uh, with our script and notes and yeah. things like that. So. So I suppose up. the only danger of putting a, a microphone on a metal table like that is that you have to not touch the table. Oh, good point. You shouldn't be like, I know you're kind of a fidgeter sometimes. I, I don't have my fidget spinner, so I'm in trouble. <laughs> so don't don't tap your leg <laughs> on the table. <laughs> good tip. Good tip. Thanks, Griffin. And then you're not using a full-size tripod. I'm not. It is uh, one of those gorilla pods, just a little small one. So yeah, it's sitting cool. on the table too, and, and away we go. I was able to cram all this and more into my uh, into my travel bag, the uh, Peak Design Everyday Backpack, 20 liter. So you, you shared a picture with me of all the stuff you brought. And it's not just camera equipment, but you also bring electronics for your kids. Yep, and myself. And does all that stuff fit in the Peak Design? It doesn't, but a lot of it does. It's, it was surprising, you know, how much of that picture I was able to... Um, to cram into that bag so I, I got a lot of it so I've got iPad MacBook Pro all my camera gear and lenses and mics and recorders uh, what else Nintendo switch all my chargers and cables and all that kind of stuff the only stuff that I didn't cram into my bag was the kids little tablets and their Nintendo DS's but yeah I, I got a lot of stuff in there do they come in multiple sizes those peak design backpacks they do I think they have a 20 and a 30 I have the smaller one okay so you probably could get the bigger one and fit everything. <laughs> yeah, but I don't like a big backpack for right, everyday yeah. use. So. Yeah. And you love that bag, right? I love that bag. And it's it, what's great is the inside. You can get to the, the main pack area from either side and the top. And it has all these adjustable like shelves. And so when you're packing stuff really tight like this, you can like pack one layer and put a shelf on top of it so it's like perfectly snug and then oh, get cool. the next layer in. So, and it adjusts really easy for camera stuff well yeah i'm that was a perfect thing to talk about today because we got a question from uh from thievy she 
actually commented on my, you know, I have that website. Uh, if you go to griffinhammond.com slash gear, you can see all the stuff that I use. Yeah. Yeah. And she handy. commented on that page uh, about the bag that I use. She was just wondering, she's looking for the right bag. And she says she really likes the side access for a camera body that's on the Low Pro 250 Fast Pack, which is actually the bag I used to use. I still have it. Uh, but she's wondering if my latest favorite bag is the Think Tank Perception Pro, which I use now, and why. Uh, so I just told her that I got the Think Tank Perception Pro because it looks nicer than the Fast Pack 250. Yeah. I was doing a lot of red carpet events and just felt a little bit self-conscious about putting, I think I'd kind of torn up my fast pack a little bit too. And I was putting on like a nice tuxedo and just felt like I needed kind of a classier looking bag. So I got the the think tank. So we need a, like a Prada camera bag right. is what you're saying. Yeah. <laughs> Gucci well, and or I, had something. To, I, I spent more because of it. I think it was a $150 bag at the time. Yeah, I like the peak design for that too. It's a very sharp looking bag and I use it. Yeah. It's kind of my work bag, so when I go visit customers and things like that, I, I look appropriate. Yeah. The irony, irony, though, of getting a... I don't know what the color is. Maybe it's taupe for this bag. It's, like, khaki-colored. <laughs> uh, it looked beautiful when I first got it, but, like, I have traveled seriously with it, so it's gotten a little stained up. I don't know if I would put it with a with a tuxedo anymore. Well, you'll have to buy another one. You'll have your day bag and your night bag. Yeah. <laughs> but, I, but I told Thievy that I... I I prefer the Fastpack 250 in some ways because it does have that side access for camera and that's really convenient. It's a little bit smaller than the Think Tank. So I like the Think Tank for its size, but one of the challenges of it is that it has all these internal compartments and they're impossible to get to without opening up the whole bag. So it's not it's not the perfect like reach inside your bag and get things out sort of bag. It just happens to have a big capacity. Yep. So it's good for air travel, and it's a little bit less convenient for actually shooting. Which is why you bring two bags with you, right? You kind of bring yeah. a bag in a bag. Yeah. In fact, on this latest trip, I was just in Switzerland and Italy over the last week. And what I did is everything goes in the Think Tank Perception Pro backpack for the plane, and it's so stuffed full, like, it'd be impossible for me to work out of that, because I'd have to take almost everything out just to get to the stuff I need. But... Then I packed my, I have a low pro messenger bag. That's also on the website. And I put that inside my suitcase when I'm traveling on the airplane. I actually like shove clothes inside it and then just put it in my checked bag. So I can get everything, sorry, not even a checked bag. I don't check anything. I carry that on as well. I can get everything on the airplane. And then when I get to my destination, I kind of repack. And I'm like, I was climbing around the mountains of switzerland and i'm just carrying like the backpack and the the messenger bag on my shoulder makes sense you had some crazy cool time lasses you shared from that trip yeah i uh i mean during during the daytime is when i'm i'm used to getting time lapses so those were pretty easy for me but i did a night time lapse mm -hmm. and i took some advice from the photographer that i was with ben gruno and he, he, he. I, I, I would have never really thought about this before. But if I'm shooting a time lapse at night and I want to get star trails and stuff, I have to wait for the moon to go down. Mm, yeah, because the moon is creating all this light pollution. So I waited until 3 a.m. when the when the moon finally went down uh, and started shooting some star trails outside. But it was crazy because it was so pitch black when I walked outside. It took me about half an hour for my eyes to adjust. And so I really didn't know what I was doing. <laughs> <laughs> well, it looked amazing. I think I saw it on Instagram or something. Do you have a full quality version of that up somewhere? Yeah. Yeah, I'll put that I'll put that up. And actually, if you look, I mean, it looks great on Instagram, but if you look really carefully at this time lapse, it's actually out of focus. Really? Yeah, Could you not almost not on Instagram. Yeah. You almost don't notice cuz really when you go out of focus on stars, they just get a little bit bigger. They're mm -hmm. still circles. Yeah. Uh, but I think what, this is one of the challenges I have to figure out is if I'm shooting in pitch black and, you know, with a long exposure, I can barely see the stars in the LCD or the viewfinder because they really appear over the 15 seconds that I'm taking the each long exposure. Shutter, yeah. Yeah. So just to be able to preview them in real time is kind of hard. So it was hard for me to set my focus and I didn't know exactly how to do it. If you I don't do just it. throw it to infinity and call it a day? 
Well, that's what I ended up doing. I ended up doing focus peaking and pulling it to infinity because the camera gives you a little guide like between the mountains and the flower. Like it yeah. gives you that. But I didn't, I, I don't often focus on infinity. That's something I barely ever do. And if I'm going to do it, I usually do it with autofocus during the day. And I'll just set the one single area of focus over a mountain, push the button, it focuses on the mountain, and I'm confident that I have infinity focus. But in this case, I couldn't trust the camera to focus on the distance because it couldn't see the distance. But you can't just take the lens and run it all the way to one end doing a manual focus? Kind of, but on these lenses, they're electronic focus. They call that uh, fly-by-wire focus. Uh huh. And there's no stop to them. They spin forever, right? Right, but the lens doesn't keep adjusting. At right, some point, but right? but I think the way that the Panasonic lenses work, they show you on the screen the little guide for focus. Mm -hmm. And infinity focus, you can go past infinity focus. Oh, I like see. Like there's a little, there's a red bar area that's like, here's infinity focus, and then the red bar after that is past it. So you're, you're actually taking infinity out of focus. <laughs> well, yeah, if you go past infinity focus, then nothing will be in focus. It's impossible for anything to be in focus. And maybe you want that. Maybe you actually want to make a blurry shot on purpose. Yeah. So it's good that it's there, but I, because I don't have a lot of experience doing that on this camera, I just didn't know where exactly do I need it. Can I trust that I put it right at the edge of the red and that's okay or so i think i just got it a little bit wrong well again i couldn't tell from what i saw so that's good yeah yeah oh yeah and it still looked cool i just need more practice shooting those kinds of time lapses one thing i figured out while i was there is is i realize i need some darker nd filters because like even the ones i have for outdoor use aren't probably dark enough mm -hmm. and you told me you're not using one right now right no, so not much depth of field. Sorry. Yeah. So what what aperture did you have to go to? Uh, let's take a peek, shall we? And bump the camera. Uh, I am at 6.3. Okay. And in fact, the sun just came out, and now I'm overexposed. Why don't I adjust that? <laughs> Is that okay? Can I shoot this live? We're doing it live. Yeah, yeah. We're doing it live. Now I'm at 7.1. What do you think of that? And you're using a pretty fast shutter speed, too. Yeah, 1 250th. So... So I figure, like, I mean, you're you're breaking the 180 rule. You're using a much faster shutter. But I figure, like, you're not moving that much. Now I am. Whoa. Yeah. <laughs> well, this will be a good test for the audience. Anyone who's watching this on YouTube can see I'm shooting mine at 1 60th of a second shutter speed. So perfect 180 degree rule for my 30 frames per second video. Nick is shooting at almost like a 45 degree angle, much faster shutter. And you should be able to see some difference in the motion blur. I have more motion blur, and when I move around, Nick has much less. I'm more beautiful. But ultimately, for this kind of thing, it probably doesn't matter too much. I doubt you're, like, ruining the visual experience for anyone. They can't bear to watch you because you're so staccato. People can't bear to watch me for many reasons, <laughs> but I don't think the shutter speed is one of them. Yeah. So I, I, I came to this realization about ND filters, and it, it applies to some questions that I just got recently. Um... We got a, I got a YouTube comment from Miguel, who was mm -hmm. actually commenting on a few episodes ago. This is episode 25 right now. But on episode 20, when I was in Singapore, we that's when I taught you how to the f-stop scale. Yeah. You only and need I to know 1 little, and 1.4. Yeah. Memorize 1 and 1.4 and then just double them and yep. you, you know the rest of the scale. That I made that a standalone video and it actually got a lot of views on YouTube. We're very it famous. It has like 25,000 views now on that. And Miguel asked, well, he, he commented, I don't fully understand why I need to know this. Like, why would I need to know that F1 is half as much light as F1.4? And this is a pretty good comment from Spemaster G who wrote, you don't, mate, just shoot. You will know it unconsciously after a short time. I mean, he's right. You don't really need to know that, but it can be helpful. It can be helpful, yeah, when you think, oh, you know, I need to double my shutter speed. Oh, wait, I know if I stop down this much, that's exactly the same, right? So it helps right. you kind of translate what one adjustment is to another. Yeah. Well, and it helped me on this trip because I've been using an ND3 filter. That's actually what I have on the camera right now because I'm shooting with a pretty good amount of light. And it's what I shoot out in sunlight. But when I was up in the mountains, we are getting so such good light, and especially on a perfectly sunny day, no clouds. It was just really strong. And I found that I was shooting with the same lens, the 12 millimeter f1.4 lens, mm -hmm. 
but I was often shooting at a f6.3, about what you're at. Yeah. Uh, with this lens. So I'm, I'm, I'm losing my shallow depth of field. It still looks great. It's a really sharp lens. It looks wonderful. But I just thought it would be nice to have an ND filter that lets me get to the f-stop, you know, down to f1.4 if I need to. So I was able to real quickly calculate in my head f1.4 is about four stops down from 6.3. It's like four and a third stops, which I guess means what? That's a half, half quarter, eighth. I think four stops is one sixteenth of the light. Oh, wow. That's dramatic. So I need I need an ND filter that does one sixteenth of the light that my current ND filter does. And my current ND filter is three stops. If I need four more stops, then I need a seven stop ND filter. Wow. So now I know that I should probably carry around a three stop ND filter, a seven stop ND filter, and I already use a 10 stop for my daytime time lapses. But I think having that middle ground would be pretty nice. Perfect. So, so now I know it's buy. You, have you ordered one yet or you just that's what you're thinking about? That's my thinking. I, I probably should order one soon because actually I'm I'm leaving for Australia tomorrow. <laughs> you might just have to walk down to a camera store and pick one up. <laughs> hey, lucky for me, I'm gonna be doing two <laughs> I'm doing two workshops in camera stores, so I should just buy one. Oh, yeah. Buy one at your first stop. There you go. Yeah. Oh, so yeah. off to Australia, huh? Yeah. I, uh, I'll i be there for a week. Uh, in fact, I guess I could talk about that real quick. I, For anyone who is down in Australia, you can find me at George's Cameras on July 15th and Digital Camera Warehouse on July 16th. What's crazy, though, is the George's Camera Workshop was sold out. Mm -hmm. And the Digital Camera Warehouse workshop was not sold out. And now I just checked, and the Digital Camera Warehouse one is sold out, and the George's Camera is no longer sold out. I don't know if they opened up more spots. That or people quit. People (laughs) heard it was going to be Griffin Hammond. They said, no, thank you. Yeah. Or maybe they listened to the podcast and they were like, I'm getting everything I need from this. I don't even need to go. Maybe that's it. So check those out. Uh, you can go to griffinhammond.com slash events, and you'll find you'll find all the details for that, and hopefully you can come to one of those two. Griffinhammond.com slash events. <laughs> what are you, a business? I'm also speaking at Simpty, which is a trade show, July 18th through 20th in uh, Sydney. Uh, and and I think that's free, actually, so you, you should come to Simpty. And if you're in Perth, I'm teaching a workshop at Photo Live Expo on July 23rd. I think that actually costs $75, but you get access to all the workshops at the event. Very cool. Can I come with you? Uh, yeah, you just have to book your ticket quickly. It's expensive. Yeah, I think maybe I'll skip that. So we got another email from Kristen. She says she is uh, teaching a dance fitness class and wants to know what's a good video setup for sharing that kind of content on YouTube. I wouldn't think that'd be too difficult. I mean, you see a lot of dance videos, and I feel like the best dance videos online don't even move or like have multiple shots. You just get one wide shot where you see all the choreography, right? Yeah, I think that's right, because you kind of want to see the leaders, you know, doing their thing. It, I think a really wide angle is important, probably somewhere in the 12 to 15 millimeter range. And they yeah. seem to always be a little low, like maybe, you know, they're shooting up at the dancers a little bit, maybe just two or three feet off the ground. Uh, well, and, and especially if you're shooting with a wide angle, getting kind of low and close creates a very dramatic distortion that's kind of fun. Like if you want to make everyone's footwork look like it's moving farther and faster it will do that if you're close and and wide yep. but i think also you could probably just do this with a phone sure absolutely yeah just to, i'd get a little tripod uh just so it's nice and ste- rock solid and steady and you're good to go yeah i mean even something like I'm, I'm sure there are like clamps for the phone i mean you might not even need a whole tripod if you can find something to mount it on or even a chair could work pretty well oh and what's the name of that company that does that really nice little the glyph you know what I'm talking about? Yes. They just released a new version I read that people are, are ranting and raving about how what an improvement it is. So it'll fit oh, any cool. sized phone, and now it has, I guess, three tripod mounts instead of just one, so you can kind of mount it at whatever angle you want. So yeah. I've heard that's it's a nice little upgrade, so I've been thinking about grabbing one of those. Yeah, years ago uh, I used Studio to use a Neat. Glyph. That's what it is. I just thought of it. Yeah. StudioNeat.com, I think. 
is it still just like a little tiny plastic thing that sticks on the bottom of the phone and it has a tripod mount? Yep. Yeah, but they've yeah. designed it very smartly because they know you don't want your phone to, uh, to hit fall. the ground. Yeah. yeah. And then the only other thing I think about with the dance class is that you could, when you're uploading it to YouTube, you could be running into some problems with copyright. Mm, yeah, I'm sure the the music in there is going to be copyrighted. Hopefully it's just one that's going to stick ads on your video and, and, and let you move on. Right. And it depends on who your audience is for the for the video. Like, I think some of these videos, when YouTube puts ads on them, they'll let you keep it online. That's great. Your American audience can probably watch it. Sometimes your foreign audiences can't. Like, maybe your German viewers don't get to see it because it's copyrighted. So you'll lose some access for people. Yep, makes sense. I got a comment on, let's see, which video was this? It was my how to set up your GH5 video. And there's a YouTube comment from Bruno and Locky, just wondering, how did I capture the audio? They say it's very crisp and clear, and they can't see my mic. And they have been using a Rode NT1 and a mixing desk. I actually don't... Do you know what a mixing desk is? It's probably a soundboard, small soundboard. Yeah. Uh, they use it for their gaming stream, but they don't think they're matching my sound quality, so they're wondering what they should do. I'm guessing you were using one of your shotgun mics, right? Yeah, I for that I was using my Rode NTG3, mm -hmm. which is my most expensive microphone. It's a $750 microphone. But I'll tell you, I think I can only tell the difference between the $250 NTG2 and the $750 NTG3 when I'm doing a direct side-by-side -side comparison. I'd have to listen to each one back and forth, and then I can tell the difference. But I don't think any of my viewers can tell when I'm using which microphone on my projects. So you don't need to spend that much money. But I think the trick is just getting it close. Usually what I do is I set the camera just a little bit above my eyes. If I just shoot a little bit high angle, I can usually bring the microphone from below a little bit closer without yep. getting in the shot. And likewise, that shot was actually, in that video, I actually shot from below. And so I just brought the mic in from the top. And it was probably a foot away from my face. But it's just kind of suspended above the camera. Yeah, that's what I'm doing right now. So you can't see it in the shot, but just below the shot right here is the microphone pointed right at my face. So it's only that far away. Yeah, I'm sure you're getting much clearer audio than had you put it on the camera. Yeah, I'm a little worried it's a little low, but we'll take care of that in post. Yeah, well, and I can hear like, I can hear birds in the background. Are there like cicadas too? Yeah, there appear to be some cicadas that have started up. So we got that going for us. <laughs> cool. I'm, which microphone are you using? Uh, Rode VideoMic Pro. I don't know if I know that one, because I have the Rode VideoMic Go. Mm. This is a power, this, it's a powered one, so it's got a 9-volt battery in it, uh, and it's a do powered mic. Do you like mic. it? I do. It's kind of what I use for all my weddings and stuff like that. It does a oh, nice cool. job, you know. I started using the, the Rode VideoMic Go when I was at Bloomberg, and I don't like it because it breaks easily. Oh. I mean, it's a good microphone. Quality, uh, sound-wise, it's good. But uh, if you're watching the video version, I'm showing I have a broken one right now. The design is kind of... doesn't seem like a very smart design. The shock mount... The, the microphone's just kind of, like, suspended above the shock mount by this... It's connected by this little tiny piece of plastic. And I've broken it. And I've tried to, like, tape it and glue it, and it always just breaks again. Oh, no, I've had mine for years, and it's been pretty rock solid. So maybe that one was just a... Does yours have the same, like tiny plastic connection or is it a little bit smarter i mean it has it has kind of a three-sided cage that it's and then it's got rubber mounting the mic to it so it is suspended around this cage but it's done with rubber straps yeah. i guess i'm pretty rough on my stuff too yeah but i do like road products i'm not endorsed by them or anything i have used a lot of road mics and i i like them but i would not recommend the video mic go Makes sense. We've got a YouTube comment from Ron Johnson who says he loves your videos and he's learned a ton. So good job for you. Griffin. Thank you. <laughs> uh, he wants to know if you can explain prime lenses. Just when I think I have it, I see something totally opposite, he says. He says you recommended an 11 millimeter prime on an earlier video for shooting real estate, but he can't seem to find one anywhere. So we probably didn't recommend an 11 millimeter. We may have recommended a 12 millimeter. Yeah, I, 11 sounds odd to me, but... I mean, I'm sure there are 11 millimeter primes. I can't imagine there's nothing stopping someone from making that. Just kind but of an odd number. Usually you see even numbers. 
Yeah, I guess you're right. I I use the the 12 millimeter prime uh, by Panasonic that I really like, and we were probably talking about the 12 to 35 is good. Which is the lens uh, I'm using right now. Yeah, and that's I mean that's probably a great real estate lens because you can get the pretty wide shot, and you can get some close ups if you need them. But then we probably were even saying like maybe go with the the 7 to 14 millimeter, or there's also a uh, the new 8 to 18 millimeter which I think is a Leica lens by Panasonic. Yep. Those would be really wide. I mean, you'd 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 be kind of maybe a little bit distorted, but uh, you could really show a whole room pretty well. And just to clarify, in case it's not clear, a prime lens is just a lens that does not zoom. So it, it's right. a fixed uh, field of view lens. So you have zoom lenses, which is this 12 to 35 is a zoom lens because it can adjust its uh, field of view. And a prime lens is a fixed field of view. In general, right. prime lenses are going to be a little less expensive because you give up that flexibility. So you can get what we would call a fast lens, which is a lens that lets in a lot of light, a low f-stop number, uh, for less money than if you are trying to get a zoom lens at that same uh, f-stop. Right. So generally, I think when you have, you know, if you get a DSLR or something, you probably want two lenses. You probably want a good prime lens and a good zoom lens because your zoom may be f four to five six or something it might be kind of a dark lens but your prime lens will probably for the same price be much faster like an f2 or less yeah absolutely so i think most people probably need the versatility of a zoom plus the like low light performance of a prime yep makes sense here's a youtube comment from kyle markham uh he said he's making a documentary and just wants to know when do you create the story since you're not actually writing a script Do you remember, did I ever write a script for Sriracha? Well, you did write a script for Sriracha, or at least kind of an outline uh, of what yeah. you were looking for. So um, I think you do that in pre-production before you start shooting, and then again in the editing bay, right? Yeah, I think I, w I did do a lot of research, tried to write an outline, but mostly that was just so that I could make sure I'm asking the right questions. Like if I kind of know the things that might be in the story, I need to ask questions that hit those points. But then once I ask those questions, I learn new things, and maybe there's new drama introduced to the film. So you really are making it in the edit. And I like to think that documentary is a lot of experimenting. I like to kind of play around in the edit and see what feels best. So, yeah, you could shoot the whole documentary without really knowing what your script is, but you want to know, you want to have an idea at least, so you're not lost. Makes sense. We've got a YouTube comment from Tim Morgan who says he was looking at your gear list and the GH5 plus all those awesome lenses totals to around $8,000. He says for just a little more money, you could get an FS7 or the EVA1 and be shooting raw and open up a lot of doors in terms of client clients. You ever thought about going that route? You know, I, I haven't because I haven't thought it's particularly necessary for me to shoot raw uh, in my career. I mean, I don't feel like I'm closing doors to clients. I haven't, I don't have people asking me to shoot raw and I'm going, Oh man, I don't, I can't do it. Although I have started shooting raw photos with the GH5 for a long time. I wasn't cause I just, I didn't consider myself a photographer and I thought, why do I need to take up all the extra space on the card? And it's like, I, I knew that there's more dynamic range in RAW, but I kind of forgot how much more. Yeah, it's dramatic. <laughs> yeah, so when I was up in Switzerland, a lot of these time lapses I was shooting, I decided to start shooting them in RAW, and when I was pulling them in to Photoshop and correcting them and setting the exposure, I was like, wow, this is really powerful. So you're right, you know, if I shot some projects in RAW, I would have a lot more control over the dynamic range and what I want to do with the image. But I, I don't feel like what I'm doing now is holding me back from anything. Yeah, I, was, I mean, have you ever had a client ask you what kind of camera you're going to use when you go come to shoot something? No, I don't think I have. And that's something I hear a lot of photographers talk about. Like, I think some wedding photographers probably get these questions from their clients. I think there are blog posts that, that explain to people what questions you're supposed to ask your wedding photographer in your interview with them. And a lot of times it's like, ask them what camera gear they use, because you probably want to hear Nikon or Canon or something. And it's just such a a nonsense question. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, I guess it'll help you weed out people who have absolutely no, no idea what they're doing. You know, if somebody says they're going to shoot on their Android phone, I'd be You're right. Concerned, then that's, but... a, that's a red flag. Yeah. But... <laughs> 
<laughs> but yeah, any professional. I mean, look at the quality of their work, not the camera. If if their stuff looks good at all, it almost doesn't matter what camera they're shooting with. And I, and I definitely don't think that Canon and Nikon are superior to Sony or Panasonic. Uh, this is what a lot of photographers use. Yep, makes sense. So our final question today comes from a YouTube comment from Austin Robinson, who also says he's a longtime fan. He's learned a lot. That's good. And he's wondering what paperwork I use for contracts or legal agreements, uh, especially when dealing with terms of payment and how the footage can be used in the future. He's just wondering if I have a contract that I've made up, uh, that I print off for projects, and if it's important to know about the legal side and having clients sign off on things. I do have a contract that I can share. In fact, I think we shared that a couple episodes ago. Yeah, I think we did. So I'll pull that, I'll put that in the show notes again at Hey.Film. But I don't know, how often do you have people sign stuff? Well, whenever I do weddings, I do have a contract I sign. And really what it is for me is a way of setting expectations so everyone is yes. on the same page, right? I'm not a lawyer. I'm sure legally it doesn't protect me in all the ways it could. But it's me saying here on paper is what you're going to get. You know, here's what you should expect. Here's when I expect payment. It just kind of lays out that whole process. You know, what are they paying and what are they getting for that payment? And, um, and then I also use it to collect information like location and times just so it's all on a document that they've agreed to. So if it changes down the line, we can say, hey, you know, that changed from what we talked about before. So that's that's right. how I use it. Yeah, I think you're perfectly you're exactly right by saying it's about setting expectations, whether or not you ask anyone to ever sign anything. All of your projects involve setting expectations and just just so that when you're finished with the project, people are happy with it. Uh, so I think just any client I want to talk to over the phone or in person or via email and just let them know how I plan to use the footage in the future. And I just find that if I'm nice to everyone, if I have a good relationship with my clients, then later when I say, hey, can I use this in a YouTube tutorial video? People are fine. Yep. Because they were happy with me. So yep. I think just just recognize that you need to keep people happy and uh, and make sure they understand going into a project what's going to happen with this footage. And just on a tactical level, I've used um, Adobe's Echo Sign to send contracts to people and have them review and sign electronically and send back to me, which works pretty well. And they've got, at least at the time, that I could get like 10 free a month, which was like plenty for me. So I just always use their free plan. Oh, nice. So do you create the contract in their service? No, no, you just saw, so like, like, upload your PDF? Exactly, yeah, I just used Word and, and upload the PDF, and then you can add, like, all the sections where they can fill in information. And oh, cool. It's kind of neat. Hey, I forgot, there's one more question that wasn't that important, but it just made me think. It was a question, a YouTube comment from Red Stallion 2000, and it was on that, that remembering how to memorize the f-stop scale video. He wrote, how can something be four times less than something else? Isn't that just one quarter? <laughs> <laughs> a good point. A good point. And I started to feel defensive. I was like, no, I, it could be four times less. But then I thought, I think he's right. Yeah. Is he I, right? I, I kind of went through that in my head just now. <laughs> if something is four times less, I don't think that makes any sense, realistically. I so you can't say something is four times smaller. <laughs> four times what? Four times itself? Because then it would be zero. <laughs> And and you can't have four times less light. You can just have a quarter of the light. Yeah. There must be some way to say four times. Like, uh, uh, move the aperture four times farther in. I, <laughs> <laughs> I think we all got what you were saying, though. But, uh, yeah. but Red Stallion 2000, I think, has got you dead to rights right there. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you, Red Stallion 2000, for pointing out my mistakes. Well, that was good. Yeah. We're I'm glad we could catch you in the middle of your vacation. End. The end. I gotta go to work tomorrow. So next week when we're back, you will be back in Las Vegas? That's correct. And will I will be in Sydney? I'll be in I'll be in Sydney, yeah. Yeah. Alright, very good. Cool. You wanna well, try uh, an Australian goodbye since you were putting some Australian greetings in some videos recently? Oh yeah. I, what did I say? I said, how you going, Australia? <laughs> that was pretty I don't, good. I don't know how to say goodbye in Australian. Do I just say good day? I think maybe goodbye. <laughs> goodbye, you Australians. <laughs> <laughs> All 
All right, Griffin, we'll talk to you later. Yeah, I'll see you next week. Bye-bye. All right, I need to get this footage to you quick, though, because I'm going to be getting yeah. on a plane later. So I'm going to go oh, cool. get it dumped right now and sent to you. And if you could just pull it down right away, that'd be good. Yeah. Yeah.